Hello and welcome to my series of conversations with men and women whose ideas, vision and philosophy define our contemporary world. My guest today is one of India's most distinguished lawyers, certainly, most certainly of his generation. Um, I say has been a distinguished lawyer because at the moment uh, he's a minister in the central government, minister for science and technology, and represents a new breed of politicians perhaps inspired by uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, who bring a new professionalism, a new vision, a new eloquence uh, to the craft and functioning of politics. Uh, he's been president of the Supreme Court Bar Association. He was educated at St. Stephen's College and Harvard Law School. I'm delighted to welcome Kapil Sibyl. Thank you. Uh, Kapil, a, 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 a break of moving away from a primary profession uh, as a lawyer uh, and, 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 and being a politician with the kind of background that you've had uh, and in pretty much in the rough and tumble of politics you represent Chandni Chowk opposite the, you know, the, the, the Lal Kila, the sort of the center of India in a sense. How does that transition work? Well, you know, quite frankly, um, when I entered politics I never thought about it. Uh, I just wanted to, to, to actually be in the midst of all this because I think that uh, India needs uh, committed people. It needs people who want to change and take India forward. Was it genuinely sort of that, that, that sort of feeling oh, of, yes. of, of oh, yes. serving, of, of altruism Ab and being driven Ab by Ab that? Ab and, and, and that I did in my profession as well. This is not something that is unique to politics. When I was a lawyer, um, uh, I hardly remember an occasion when somebody came to me and uh, was in need. And I said to him, go away, you can't pay. Uh, it's always been my, my, my way of doing things. And I think that uh, politics allowed me to work on a much larger canvas. And that's how I got into it. And what have been some of the uh, sort of uh, the significant compromises or, or concessions that you feel you might have had to make as an individual, uh, I, as a person? I have to say that uh, uh, none. I mean, uh, none really that I can think of which are uh, significant to make me think less of myself, mm -hmm. let's put it that way. But yes, along the way you have to go by the party's ideology. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you do feel, uh, you know, your conscience tells you, look, this is not the right kind of stand mm -hmm. that the party should have taken. Mm -hmm. But then there is an element of discipline uh, because you are part of a structure, you can't just sort of say. Uh, so you have to compromise to that extent. But um, if it's fundamental to your very way of thinking, I guess then you should leave politics. And what about developing a thick skin? Now that, uh, luckily for me, uh, I haven't been uh, at the receiving end, uh, you know, f uh, that I, you know, that I needed to develop a thick skin. I don't have a thick skin. I feel very agitated if somebody attacks me um, um, either in unsavory terms or um, unfairly. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess that it's the rough and tumble of politics. You have to accept that in the event that that were to happen. I do remember that uh, there have been occasions when this has happened and I've been very agitated, but I let it pass. So that's sort of putting you in a spot. What might be sort of an area where you have felt at variance with the ideology of the party uh, or where you have felt and or you have felt uh, uh, say exceptionally sensitive to an attack on you personally that you felt was unwarranted? Well, let's put it this way. We, uh, when I entered politics, we were in opposition and by and large, um, when in opposition, I, you know, uh, I was at the forefront of many issues like POTA and, uh, and uh, I think thanks to Mrs. Gandhi, uh, we were able to carry. There were divergent views on POTA within the party. There still are. Uh, there still are mm -hmm. and uh, luckily we were able to carry that through. Mm -hmm. We opposed it and, uh, and I'm very glad that our government has now repealed it. Um, you had the Securitization Act in which I have a sound, I had a somewhat different view, but I went along with the party. So, Mr. Lawyer, what is your position on POTA uh, at, at this time? I mean, there is a perception that it's being repealed, but really there, it's not being repealed. Well, no, 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 no. My position on POTA, our position on POTA has been consistent. The two draconian provisions of POTA, which I thought were were uncivilized in nature, were that mm -hmm. That uh, that the the you could you could um, on the basis of a confession to a police officer convict a man, and the bail provision, which for one year 
court were not allowed to grant bail to a Pota accused unless mm -hmm. the court was satisfied that he was innocent of the offense mm -hmm. and that he would not in the future mm -hmm. commit a similar act. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to satisfy the court for that mm -hmm. because if he is innocent, then why should he be prosecuted? Mm -hmm. So we thought that those two provisions were particularly mm -hmm. draconian. Mm -hmm. And otherwise, Pota is good law. We have to deal with terrorism. It's an international commitment. And that's all that we objected to, even when uh, we opposed So in Pota. a sense, sort of, uh, Pota is being repealed, but not repealed, which sort of, would be just, it's being modified. We, we know it made, it's made more civilized. It, is, it has been made more consistent with our constitutional uh, values, value system, and our cultural values, and the way we look at uh, you know, individual liberty. Just going back to this, to this notion of politics, because in some ways you, uh, you, you, you surprise me and you surprise us uh, with your uh, sort of uh, benevolent, uh, contrary uh, uh, perception to, to, to what, what we have on the outside. You know, politics is dirty business. Uh, you know, you have tainted ministers. It's controversy. It's uh, pulling people down. It's corrupt. But Rajiv, it's up to you. I mean. I mean, it, nothing prevents you to become tainted. Nothing prevents you to be clean. Um, and you see, there is, there is a difference, I think, for those who came into politics at the grassroots level, you know, who you fought panchayat elections, elections at the block level, councillors, you've risen up the scale, so to say. And in the course of all that, you develop a lot of enmities. Uh, the political process is such that uh, it's quite easy to actually foist a case on your enemy. And uh, um, and then, of course, if you are part of the, uh, you know, those who agitate, you break the law and you go into jail. And, and then, uh, you know, in many states, I find uh, chief ministers who come to power make sure that they target their enemies in the opposition and then foist cases on them. So it's partly that. And partly the fact that if somebody else has foisted a case on you, you say, when you are in power, let me sort of mm -hmm. do the same thing on him. Mm -hmm. So in a, in a way, it's the, it's the exchange amongst in the, uh, that takes place between political personalities in the political process mm -hmm. that gets you tainted. Mm -hmm. We luckily entered politics at another level altogether. Mm -hmm. And we haven't had to go through it, mm -hmm. except for a couple of elections that I've fought. And luckily for me, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I had really no problems in the course of those elections. Mm -hmm. And what happens uh, uh, at, in, 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 in Parliament when you see people uh, rushing to the, to the to the well of the house and I feel picking up a microphone I feel and trying distraught. and what have you. I, I feel distraught. Uh, but but, but how, how, do you, how do you relate to that in the sense of, uh, in, in some ways you're obliged to respond instead of just sitting yes, there yes, and passively you know, you waiting? Do, we do respond. I have to tell you that when many of those things used to happen when we were in opposition, sometimes I felt that the party was not taking the appropriate decision when we would voice our views in the morning meetings that we had with Mrs. Gandhi presiding over those meetings. And then, of course, there would be a divergence of opinion. And then ultimately what the party decided uh, had, to be, had to be accepted. And therefore, to that extent, there is that element of compromise. Mm -hmm. But it's not fundamental to your in, you know, entire way of thinking. I mean, if it were something, if somebody were to say, look, uh, you are in this ministry, you know, the party wants you to collect this thing or that you should make in this contract, you get this commission. That's fundamental to, you know, to whatever you have stood for, in which case it's better to quit than to do that. You're watching a conversation with Kapil Sibyl. We'll be right back after a short break. Don't go away. Welcome back to continuing conversation with Kapil Sibyl, Minister for Science and Technology. You were just talking about uh, your, your, your ministry and uh, that you have felt relieved of uh, pressures, uh, you know, to, 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 to compromise and, 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 and implicitly the, you know, the whole notion of kickbacks and things that, that, that we associate with decision making processes. Is that unique uh, for your ministry and, and, and because of someone I like you running it? I think it's partly unique. Of course, of course, if you want to make money, you can make money out of anything. <laughs> Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's also a mindset. Uh, but I think this Ministry of Science and Technology is unique. Uh, there is very little uh, you know, bureaucracy involved. The bureaucracy are the scientists. The levels of discourse within the ministry are extremely high. We're dealing with high technology stuff, and we're dealing with the future of the country, what the country needs in, say, 2025. And so, uh, you know, the, I never thought of these things. <laughs> but uh, you know, you're, you're, you're working in the context of, uh, of, a, of a cultural environment. You know, Nehru talked about the need to cultivate a scientific temper. 
it's in your hands. Absolutely. You know, Ministry of Science Absolutely. and Technology. Yeah. Uh, what what is your agenda? You know, beyond obviously the I'm specifics, you're working on an aircraft. You want to work on areas of biotechnology, but in terms of this larger spirit of, uh, I, you know, I think you know, I'm really passionate about <laughs> this. I really, I, you know, if I cannot do something in the course of the next one or two years, mm -hmm. then it's not my worth being here. Mm -hmm. So I'm really passionate on this. I think we need to develop a scientific temper right from the school level upwards. Um, uh, I have uh, persuaded the Prime Minister. Um, uh, we propose that he set up a, a, a scientific advisory committee to the Prime Minister, mm -hmm. which he announced recently um, when we gave the uh, Shanti Sarup Bhatnagar Awards just before his trip to the United States. But are you fearful that, you know, the, the committees and processes and systems? No, no, no. And, what, and so what is, what, what what, is your what agenda? We need to, what uh, we need to do is to set up a, a committee of pure professionals, no politicians, right? who have a vision for the future. And we have such people in our country, in, men of enormous integrity and enormous talent. And we are going to pick a few of them. It's not going to be a large committee. And then give them the power, the authority to actually uh, have a vision for India and then allow and make sure that it's implemented. So what might be some of the mechanisms that... For uh, example, one of the things I would uh, like to do, and I would like the committee actually to look into it, we've launched the EDUSAT. Now, you know, one of the biggest problems in this country is primary and secondary education. 36% of our people are still illiterate. Um, Mrs. Gandhi is extremely committed uh, to the cause of education. In fact, we've upped the... Uh, the budget on primary and elementary education to almost 5,000 crores. The midday meal scheme money is in fact also been, uh, there's greater allocation to 3,000 crores. If we cannot educate our children through the normal processes uh, where teachers are not available in rural areas, in, in other words, if the vehicles of education used so far have failed, we need a paradigm shift and adopt new vehicles of education. But are you convinced that a paradigm shift that is technology driven, uh, instead of really being content driven, uh, is uh, really going no, to work? No, it will be content driven. Because, you know, we've had the experience uh, with, uh, with, with, with sort of Gyan Darshan and, and so many initiatives, yeah. uh, and, and, you know, we're held up, and, and they're held up as, you know, for the amounts of money that are being spent. I'll tell you the problem. Technology, and, and, and nothing happens. You're, There's no impact. You're right, Rajiv. The problem is the following. If you leave it entirely to the state, if you expect the government of India to, um, to um, prepare the software for what's going to be taught to children, then I think you're barking up the wrong tree. What we need is a public-private partnership. And one of the things that I've decided to do is to call private entrepreneurs, you know, TV channels, private TV channels, uh, have a public-private partnership and say, all right, you prepare the software. We'll, we have a satellite. We'll give you the satellite and give you as much time as you want. But you prepare world-class software because, you know, the, the, the consumer has a choice. Sitting in front of the TV, he has 50 channels before him. You must prepare a kind of software where the child will say, I want to watch that program, you know. But is, is, is this sort of... Uh, uh, a, commercially viable, and B, yes. I think very significantly that in a sense with public broadcasting uh, in India, and then this is a parallel to that, uh, sort of a parallel stream, I think, to the public bro what the public broadcaster is doing, it hasn't really worked. No, but it, uh, it, it can work provided mm -hmm. there's something in it for the private entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. If the private entrepreneur says, if he, if he produces a world-class world -class software and shows it to children, and he uses the money, uses the time for, that he can earn on the advertisements, which he can, because the, the, the range of Doordarshan is more than any other channel. So, so there's a lot of advertisement money that's available there. Mm -hmm. And he can take a share of that advertisement money. But you know, it's been frequently argued that the role of uh, commercial, uh, commercially driven television is really to deliver audiences to advertisers and not really content uh, to uh, audiences. What, 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 what about a children's program which, uh, um, um, like you had on American television on Sesame Channel Street 30, and Sesame There are Street. many examples Sesame uh, Street. of that. Sesame but I think Street. philosophically it's been, it's been demonstrated that uh, the minute you, uh, uh, you know, reach, want to reach out to audiences that don't have purchasing power, advertisers are not really interested. That's not true, but this will be seen by everybody, mm -hmm. including the urban middle classes mm -hmm. in the big cities. Mm -hmm. Sesame Street is not for the rural areas alone. Mm -hmm. It will be for everybody. Mm -hmm. 
And in fact, you can turn this channel into an edu edutainment channel. You can have entertainment in the evening mm -hmm. and education in the morning. So, you know, there are lots of mixes that you can do. Mm -hmm. And it's, I'm not going to give up merely because <laughs> in the past, you know, nothing was able to, to be done. So this, this is a context in a sense for, you know, some of your more youthful creative instincts to find expression and, 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 and find space. Tell us about that. When, when, you know, when you were sort of much younger in college, you had the sort of interest in, in, in theatre and uh, in, in, in the creative arts. What happened to that? Do you, do you sort of mourn its loss? No. Or was no. it just youthful exuberance? No, no. It's, it was, you know, just a way of expressing yourself in a different sort of um, kind of way. Uh, theatre is, in a way, mm -hmm. an expression mm -hmm. of your inner self. Uh, is just a mode of expression. Politics is yet another mode of expression. So I don't think that merely because I left theatre, I've lost out in something. No, I think that uh, uh, lawyering itself is also a way, uh, is, is a mode of expression. Uh, you know, it's the manner in which you project the matter in court that's ultimately very important, apart, of course, from the content and the substance. Mm -hmm. But manner is as important as the substance. Mm -hmm. And so also in politics. I think mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of us uh, forget mm -hmm that uh, the that in politics uh, what you project is as important as what you say mm -hmm. and uh, so i think there is a commonality mm -hmm. in all this mm -hmm. and i've not lost out anywhere you're watching a conversation with couple sibyl we'll be right back after a short break don't go away <laughs> welcome back to a continuing conversation with the minister for science couple sibyl uh, some of the other uh, significant agendas uh, for your ministry, uh, you have, uh, you know, soon after you came in uh, and took charge, there was this, you know, you talked about biotechnology, uh, you have been a vociferous supporter of HIV AIDS and, and, and combating that. Um, what is the passion? The well, principal passion, if it's possible to have a principal I, passion. I, you know, you know it's, <laughs> it's just passionate about life. Mm -hmm. It's passionate about uh, uh, you know, how others feel, uh, what state others are in. I think the, the most humbling experience that one can have is actually fight an election and go out there and watch how people smile despite the fact that they live in utter penury. There is a smile on their face. So there is hope. And I think that you, you, ought, to, you ought to appreciate that smile and realize that man is willing to adjust to anything provided he thinks that tomorrow is going to be better. Mm -hmm. I think the polit politician's task is to make that tomorrow better. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the passion. That's the passion, uh, whether it's in biotech or it's uh, in, um, you know, uh, discovering a new molecule in the field of medicine. Mm -hmm. it, it, you know, it, it gives you such a thrill if you know that down the road you have made a difference or you can make a difference. Mm -hmm. And if you're able to do that, I think life is really worth living. Mm -hmm. Were you sort of, uh, I, I know you've been asked this question a zillion times, but were you disappointed that you weren't sort of minister for law or a law minister because that's your area <laughs> of, of specialization I have to, and I have what have you? I don't mean this as, 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 as no. a political ban no, no, uh, no. benchmark of achievement, but sort of. You know, lots of people have asked me that question and I have to say that I for one, and this is something that I'm worried about, ever since I became minister of science and technology, I never ever thought that I ever went to a court of law. Mm -hmm. You know, law uh, was a, a means for me for livelihood. It turned out to be pretty good for me. <laughs> um, I have a passion for law, there is no doubt about it, but I have a passion for life. Mm -hmm. And I think science and technology, if I look at it in the larger context, uh, will contribute much greater mm -hmm. to the development of this nation and to future generations mm -hmm. than law. Mm -hmm. uh, what we need is a total transformation of the legal system. Mm -hmm. We need uh, some major surgery. Mm -hmm. What we need in science and technology is to carry the, the, the battle forward mm -hmm. in our fight against nature mm -hmm. to be able to overcome it mm -hmm. to the extent that we can and therefore benefit mankind. I think the benefits in science and technology are much larger. No, I was not disappointed at all. In fact, I think that I would not give this ministry up for anything. Mm -hmm. I love this ministry. But let me say another thing to you. One of the things that I have been thinking mm -hmm. as Minister of Science and Technology is what can I do for law? Mm -hmm. 
and I've come up with something. You mean the application of science and technology exactly. to law? Exactly. And I've okay, come reveal. Up, yes, <laughs> reveal. I've come up with something. Are we going to have uh -huh. a major meet, a brainstorming on the 7th of November, mm -hmm. which has already been fixed? I want to actually change the whole investigative process through technology. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest problems that our country has today is that the police officer is in charge of the investigating process and he can actually manipulate a lot of things in the course of the investigation. Can technology provide an answer? And if we are able to solve that, in other words, if mm -hmm. the foundation is strong, mm -hmm. then no lies can be built upon that foundation. Mm -hmm. So one of my major tasks in the Ministry of Science and Technology mm -hmm. is to actually allow technology to be used by the investigator mm -hmm. to ensure mm -hmm. that he does not manipulate the investigative process. Mm -hmm. And that's something that I'm really passionate mm -hmm. about. So at the end of your, uh, uh, you know, presumably four years and some months uh, as Minister uh, of Science and Technology, what would you like to have achieved? What would you like people to say? He was minister for five years and this is what he did. Well, I think that uh, <laughs> what, what I, and it's very difficult to really uh, to think in those terms. But if I went out of this ministry five years from now and people said he made a difference, that's enough for me. Uh -huh. What aspiration do you have for yourself uh, in, in, in politics? In some ways, you know, it, 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 it almost sounds um, disarmingly perfect, you know, the, the notion that, that you wish to serve and you surrender to the process of serving a context that uh, politics provides. I suspect we've gotten so uh, used and habituated to associating, you know, the notion of the pursuit of power uh, with politics that it sort of uh, becomes difficult to reconcile with, with the notion of pure altruism uh, and, 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 and coexisting with public life. In my life, and I've been in various positions, even in, your, even, even in the course of your profession, you control a lot of people. Mm -hmm. I mean, in your private world, uh, uh, you do control a lot of people. But I have never in my life exercised power. Mm -hmm. I always had it never exercised it mm -hmm. and I've never exercised power even as a politician I never say to somebody you know without any discussion you do this because I want you to do this no that's not my way mm -hmm. and I think that if politicians were to realize that and I think Dr. Manmohan Singh is an ideal example you know th the way in which he carries people with him that doesn't mean he doesn't have a point of view but you always take decisions in the context of the situation and what generally people want you to do, right? And I can feel the pulse of the scientific community within my ministry. They want change. They want autonomy. They want excellence. They want freedom in their joints. They don't want any bureauc bureaucratization. They want commitment in R&D. They want to serve their passion is science. They want to serve the cause of science for humanity. Mm -hmm. What you have to do is to give them direction. Mm -hmm. For example, one of the things I said was, look, don't, don't uh, make investments in technology which will bypass the common man. Mm -hmm. If you bypass the common man, what's the use of your technology? Mm -hmm. So make sure. So that's direction. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'll give you freedom. I don't want to interfere as to who should be a director of this laboratory. In fact, I've made a, I've sent a circular, probably you don't know, many people don't know. I've sent a circular to all the directors of all my laboratories in the CSIR, in fact, in the Science and Technology Ministry. Whoever lobbies with me for a position will be automatically disqualified. I think the scientists mm -hmm. want that because the scientists want to choose their own peers, mm -hmm. their own people, mm -hmm. so that the cause of science is served. We must give that environment to them. We want regulation. For example, one of the things we've been talking about is that, you know, animal testing has been prohibited, prohibited in this country. There's a large section of people in this country who don't like animals to be tested. And I think, I think there, is a, there is a point of view. But the fact of the matter is, without animal testing, you cannot uh, you know, go for the next stage that is human testing. Mm -hmm. Now, our scientists and our labs have to fly out to do the animal tests which in fact increases the expenditure on R&D. Much of this derives from a, 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 a personal, a, a structure of a personal moral philosophy, uh, a, a vision, a, a view of life, and it, it often derives from religion or spirituality or, or you know, a strong moral framework. 
What, what is it for you? Do you have a, a religious framework no. that you respond to? No. A, uh, no. If I at the end of the day can sleep well at night and ask myself the question, have I harmed anybody during the day? And the answer is no, I haven't. That's, mor mor that's morality for me. Mm -hmm. You know, God and all that is lip service to to something that is that we believe in uh, an extraterrestrial power mm -hmm. uh, extra celestial power <laughs> uh, but uh, no i believe in i believe in uh, goodness kapil sibal thank you very much thank you it's been a great pleasure thank, thank you, you.